I'm sitting in church, so of course I've got my church clothes on. Which raises the question, what exactly are church clothes anyway? We're starting a new series this week at Kingscliff, and it's kind of a simple one. We're going to be asking some simple questions, some basic questions. And so the series is titled Church 101. We'll be looking at questions like, how do you study the Bible? How do you worship? How do you listen to a sermon? And yes, even how to attend church. Maybe you've been attending church your whole life, or maybe you're new to this whole church thing. Whichever it is, I'm sure that as we take a look from a biblical perspective at what church is and what church isn't, that you'll be blessed and challenged. Thanks so much for joining us this week at Kingscliff. Father in heaven, we are mindful of the fact that we have already been richly blessed. You have already ministered to us through the beautiful Father's Day video and the songs and that amazing cello piece. Father, where would we be in life without the sound of the cello? Father, surely the cello is itself a sign of your goodness and of your creativity. Lord, the sound of this instrument just moves us in our innermost souls. Father, we are thrilled about the new Sabbath school classes that are starting, and now as we open scripture. At the end of the day, that's what Sabbath school is about. At the end of the day, that's what coming here is about. It's about connecting with you. Uh, Father, as we open scripture, particularly as we prepare to begin a new series, we just pray that your spirit will be in this room and in the hearts of the people that are in this room. Father, it has been a thrill for us to see young people participating in the service today, in the music and in the prayer. And Father, now as we open scripture, we ask that you would open us up that we might better understand you, that we might better understand ourselves, and that we might better understand the world around us. Thank you, Father, for having heard this prayer. Be with us now, we ask. In Jesus' name, let everyone say amen. Amen. Excellent. All right. Well, I'm really excited about this uh, new series that we're going to be starting today. And the series is going to be a four-part series. At least that's the tentative plan. It could expand into five or six parts, but For the time being, it's going to be a four-part series, and the title of the series is Church 101, right? We've just finished a series in the not-too-distant past, The Beautiful Believable Basics. Thank you, Carolyn. God bless you for moving to the front. The Beautiful Believable Basics, which was sort of a theological look at at the basics of the Christian faith, and we then went into our Eat in Every Day series, and and I thought, you know, as I was thinking about this new series, and I, I frankly... I'm super excited about a series we're going to do on marriage a little bit later in the year, and we're also going to probably do a series on the nature of suffering before the year is out. I'm really looking forward to wrestling with some of those thorny issues of the goodness of God and the face of suffering. But in the meantime, it just sort of dawned on me, particularly as in some ways the church is in a bit of a transition, that that we need people, people like Darnell, uh, who was just up here a moment ago, to say, you know, you can't do nothing. You can't do nothing, and it dawned on me that there might be some people here who have been going to church wrong for most of their church-going life. They don't know how to go to church. And so I'm going to give you a four-part series on how to be a good church member, right? And the first, they're all going to be very practical. The first is going to be titled, How to Read the Bible and Have Devotions. How to Read the Bible. It's going to be absolutely great. Um, The whole series, I've sort of broken it down into these four parts, and these are at least the four that we'll do. We might add one or two later, but this is what we're going to be doing over the course of the next four weeks. Today, how to read the Bible and have devotions. Next week, we're going to have an interesting sermon titled, How to Attend Church. How to Attend Church. How many of you have been attending church for most of your life? You might find out next week that you've been doing it wrong for a long time. We're actually going to have a sermon on how to attend church because there is a significant number of us that come to church and we're doing it all wrong. We're doing it all wrong. We're going to then have a series or a sermon titled How to Worship, which I'm really looking forward to. And then finally, and I think this will be a particularly exciting one, how to listen to a sermon. Right? You might think, oh, I know how to listen to it. No, many of you don't know how 
to listen to a sermon. And so this is going to be a super practical series. You might look at that and think, man, is Pastor Asherite trying to insult our intelligence? No, I'm not insulting it. I'm just affirming it. I'm just affirm- affirming your intelligence, and we're going we're gonna to take a swing at any residual ignorance that might be there. I'd like to introduce you to a bit of a categorization that I've been playing around with in my own mind that I'm really excited about, and I hope you can get excited about, and I hope we'll in some way help you to better understand who you are and where you are and sort of where you find yourself in the local church, in this local Kingscliff church, or if you're watching uh, online or on on television, your your own local situation and your own local church. And uh, one of the things that you sort of discover when you get into pastoral ministry, and and I've not been in pastoral ministry for very long. I pastored a church for seven years uh, prior to coming here, and then now I've pastored here for about five years. And so I've only got about 10 to 12 years experience, and I think I'm doing a serviceable job, but there are some things that you learn really quickly when you come into a a situation like a local church where everybody's basically a volunteer, right? In the other ministries that I've worked with, I've worked like at Light Bearers, and, and everybody there, you know, was paid to be there, and they were employees, and you had jobs, and there were expectations associated with those jobs, but there's a bit of a culture shock, a transition when you go into a local church, and people are there voluntarily. They already have day jobs, whether they're a builder or a teacher or a nurse or whatever it is, and so you're trying to accomplish things. You're trying to carry out tasks, and the church is getting behind these things, but because you're dealing with a volunteer workforce, you can't leverage the, hey, you're paid to do this, and if you don't do it, there will be some punishment. You have to rally. You have to try to gain support and get people excited about something. And one of the things I've noticed is that it's helpful to sort of help people assess themselves where they are in their own relationship to the local church, and of course, that as an extension of their relationship to Jesus, which is what this whole Church 101 series is going to be about. How do we do church right? Not just serviceably, not just manageably, but how are, how are we doing church and how can we do church better? And I want you to sort of turn the mirror of introspection and the mirror of self-reflection onto yourself here for just a few moments. In fact, through the whole series, actually, not just for a few moments. But, but for this few moments here, I want to walk you through a, a bit of a rubric, a bit of a categorization and a continuum that I've been developing and I hope you'll find it helpful. I want to talk to you about people that attend a local church, whether this one or any local church, whose faith is in crisis, okay? These are people who might attend church, they might even wear the right clothes, they may even return tithe, but in terms of their actual faith connection to God, there is almost no faith connection. Uh, There's very little time in scripture, there's very little time in fellowship, there's virtually no time in ministry. They might be attending church and everything might look okay from the outside. There might be this sort of veneer of Christianity, but, but you know in your soul that there's in fact a crisis there, a crisis of faith, whether you're too busy or you've uh, wound your way into some addiction that you didn't foresee or whatever it might be. If you had to self-diagnose with honesty and with transparency and integrity, you would say, you know, my faith right now, my journey is in crisis. There may have been a time in the past where you were super on fire and and you couldn't be stopped and you were excited and you had evangelistic fervor. But if you sort of turned the mirror of reflection and introspection on yourself right now, you would self-identify. This isn't the pastor suggesting diagnostically what you are. I'm, I'm asking you to think about yourself. And some people in here would say, you know, my faith is in crisis for a variety of reasons. We'll talk about what some of those reasons might be. There are others that come to church, sort of a step up from crisis, who you might categorize your faith experience, and as an extension of that, your experience with the local church, as casual, right? Not in crisis. It's not like you're on the emergency room table, you know, so to speak, and your faith is, you know, slowly dwindling away, uh, you know, prisoner to some addiction or some struggle that you have, but you're casual, Right, you come to church, maybe not super regularly. You don't really come to Sabbath school. Um, you're, you're casual. You show up at the right times, and you, know, you see people, and you greet. And, and even in your own personal relationship with Jesus, you find time for Scripture and for prayer and for ministry when it's convenient. Right? It is a priority, but it's, it's, not, it's not at the top of the priority list. Right? You would identify if you met somebody on a plane or in a grocery store and you got to talking about these things. You would identify as a Christian. You would identify as a follower of Jesus. But, but your faith would probably best be characterized at this point in time as casual. Right? You have a casual association with Jesus, very likely a casual association with the local church as well. Moving up from crisis and casual, getting better as we go sort of up the continuum, is what we might call committed. 
A person who's committed is somebody who is committed to Jesus and committed to the local church. They're, they're, they're in a relationship with Jesus. They are regularly opening the Bible. They are regularly spending time in prayer. They're even taking opportunities as those opportunities present themselves to witness, to minister, to be involved in service projects like the one we have coming up next Sunday. These are people that are committed. They're committed to Jesus, they're committed to the local church, they're committed to scripture. Very likely, though not in every case, they were raised Christians, they're generational Christians. They come to church, they're committed to a local church because their parents were committed to a local church. And maybe even their parents' parents were committed to a local church. These are the kinds of people you really want to see in your local church. Of course, you want to see everybody, whether you're in crisis or you're casual or you're committed. You want people coming. We want sinners coming to the feet of Jesus. But these are the people that really make a local church. They're the lion's share uh, of the rank and file of what make up a local church. But there is a step. There is a place even above and beyond merely committed, and that is contributor. Somebody who is a contributor does not have their faith in crisis. They are not a mere casual associate, uh, uh, in a mere casual association with Jesus or with the local church. And they're not just committed. They're not just somebody that in some sort of ethereal or even practical sense is committed. No, there are tangible, actual, measurables in a local church. And in terms of a larger sense of kingdom building, they see themselves as contributing to the kingdom, as contributing to a local church. And, and they, insofar as it's possible, they're doing what they can and they would like to do more. Now, I don't know how you self-diagnose there, but I, I want you to just take a moment here of introspection, of, of sort of personal self-diagnosis and assess where you are right now, not where you have been in the past, not the fact that you might be a generational Christian or, or whatever it might be. Where are you today? Would you, if in a moment of total transparency and honesty, not before Pastor Asherick, but before the Holy Spirit, where are you at in your faith journey? Are you, in fact, in a bit of a crisis right now? Or would you characterize your association with the local church and with Jesus as casual? When it's convenient, yeah, it is a priority. Don't get me wrong. It is a priority, but it's not the priority. And it certainly isn't the top priority. Or maybe you're committed. Maybe you're somebody who says, you know what? No, I'm committed, but, but right now I just don't have a lot of time for the local church or to do much kingdom building. Well, the goal of myself and of Pastor Joel and the others here that are in leadership, whether in, in full-time leadership or in the eldership team, is to try and move people along that continuum. If we meet somebody who's at a crisis in their faith, we say, hey, look, how can we move you from crisis to something more consistent, right past casual and into committed? Now, I'm going to draw a line up here, and that line is, I think, an important line, and I want to sort of say something here that I think is going to be very important for you to hear. And that is the idea that above the line is where we want everybody, right? We want people that are committed and people that are contributors. But I recognize, as anybody would that's been in a local church situation, that life has its seasons and life has its cycles, right? We, we go uh, into periods where we are more available and we have more time or, or then there's a pregnancy or then there's a financial setback or you have to work more hours and you have to pull back a little bit from a local situation, a local church, or from your kingdom building. But you're still committed. So in that sort of seasonal ebb and flow of life, there have been times in the past where you've been very involved. I could point to people in this church that have been significantly involved in leadership positions in this local church. But right now you're at a season where you're still committed, but you're, you're sort of, we want to get everybody above the line. The goal is to get everybody above the line. If you're a local member, now next week or the week after, we'll talk about visitors. Visitors come in different shapes and sizes as well. We're not talking here about visitors. We're talking about members. People that identify as members of a local church or members of a local community and as followers of Jesus. How do we as a pastoral staff and how does we as a local congregation get people past crisis, past merely casual, and into committed? And then how do we get people from committed to contributor? Well, I think there's a lot of answers to that question. And one of the things I'm going to try and do over the course of this series is give a very practical assessment of how to do some of the most basic things in church. How to worship. Right? You think, well, everybody knows how to worship. This morning in Sabbath school, I asked some of our young people, I was teaching the Sabbath school class because Sam Bonello's unwell today, and I said, did your parents teach you how to pray, or is it just something you kind of picked up? Right? Did you teach your children how to pray? Did your, did, did, did your parents, I asked them, did your parents teach you how to pray? Were you taught how to worship, or did you just sort of pick it up? And if you just sort of picked it up, there's a problem. If you went into a church that wasn't doing worship right, it wasn't doing church right, and you just sort of picked up worship and you just sort of picked up the culture, you might have, you might have caught 
uh, the flu, you might have picked it up wrong. So what we're going to try and do over the course of this series is take a look at what Scripture says how to read the Bible, how to attend a local church, how to worship, and even how to listen to a sermon. Because even though you might have been doing it for many years or perhaps your whole life, it's possible that you could have been doing so wrong. And so today we're going to talk about how to read the Bible. Something that's right at the heart, it's just so utterly foundational. It's just such a central part, an inexorable part of the Christian experience, of course, is the Bible. Right? The Bible. And we know that. That's not a surprise to anybody here. Nobody say, what? The Bible? I no, no, it's the Bible. But what role does the Bible play in your personal journey? And I'll just kind of put some of my cards right out on the table here. And say that if at some level you are not regularly and in a committed fashion spending time in Scripture, it's going to be very difficult for you to be a committed or a contributing member of a local church. Right? You might actually be in a local church. You might be attending this local church. But if you're not connected to God through Scripture with some modicum of regularity, your faith is in crisis. You might not self-diagnose as your faith in crisis, but in fact... Your faith is in crisis. And I want to try to do something today to sort of help you to get your mind wrapped around how to read the Bible, a book that for many of us, we were never really taught how to read it. Our parents didn't really sit us down and say, you know, this is the direction of the Bible. This is the trajectory of the Bible. This is the purpose of the Bible. We just sort of picked it up. And in some cases, we probably picked it up well. And in other cases, we may have picked up some pathologies and we think just having the Bible in the house or bringing the Bible to church or just owning a Bible as some kind of a lucky charm that that's passable. Several years ago, I read a book by a guy named Feridun uh, uh, Batman Gelich, an Iranian doctor. Fascinating book. I read it probably t almost 20 years ago. And uh, the book is titled, You're Not Sick, You're Thirsty. You're not sick, you're thirsty, and, and the subtitle of this one is uh, Water for Health, Healing, and Life, but the title of the book that I read was titled, You're Not Sick, You're Thirsty, Your Body's Many Cries for Water. Now, in the book, has anyone here read the book, by the way? It's a fascinating book. Okay, you've read it. It's great. I, I loved the book. I don't know what your experience was, Judith. I loved it. You know it. Okay, I read the book. It's amazing. And basically, what this Iranian-born doctor, Dr. Batman Gelich says, is, is that you actually are dehydrated. He goes through a number of statistics, it's amazing, he goes through a number of statistics identifying how much water we should be taking in and all of the sort of pathologies that develop from just the simple fact of not being sufficiently hydrated. In fact, in the book, uh, Dr. Batman Gelich says, we have made the mistake of assuming that because water is so freely available and costs nothing, the body cannot probably fall short of water. I believe that most physical pains are signals that the body needs rehydrating and that we ignore these signals at our own peril. I love the book for a variety of reasons. First of all, it was right in harmony with my own desire and passion to live a healthful life. But one of my favorite things about it was that there could be these really simple uh, solutions to seemingly complicated problems. And I've put that up here in front of you. Seemingly complicated problems can have right in front of you really simple solutions. I just love even the title of the book. Hey, you're not sick. You're thirsty. Your body's many cries for water. And I was thinking about this series in terms of what it means to be a local church member and what it means to read the Bible. And, and I guess at the bottom most level, what it means to be a follower of Jesus. I suppose that, that many of us are manifesting what we might regard as complicated spiritual problems. Like, oh, I'm depressed, or oh, I have anxiety, or oh, I have an addiction, or oh, I'm stressed out, or oh, I, whatever it might be. And I'm not suggesting, by the way, that these are not legitimate and actual diagnoses that people can have, of course. But I'm going to suggest here this morning that we need God just like we need water. Right? That you were made to need God. That there is, there is a, an essential part of the human being that requires a spiritual component and not just some general, you know, sort of out there airy fairy spiritual component, but you need a connection with the living God of scripture that made you and that created you. We were created to be connected in the same way as, as uh, Dr. Batman Gelich describes in the book, you are made up of water. Some 90 plus percentage uh, percent of your body is water. Right? And so it stands to reason that you're going to need to have a lot of water intake, and that's going to help you in all of these various physiological capacities. Well, similarly, you were not made to be a consumer. You were made to be a connector. And I want to talk about that next week, the difference between 
coming to church as a consumer and coming to church as a connector and as a contributor. You weren't made to be primarily a consumer, and you were not made primarily to be an observer. You were made to connect, to connect vertically with God and to connect horizontally with those around you. And so maybe there's some sense in which it looks like this. You're not stressed. You're disconnected. You're not anxious. You're disconnected. You're not addicted. You're disconnected. Now, again, I don't want to deny that there are actual legitimate pathologies and, and diagnoses that people can fall into. I'm not suggesting that. But in some cases, I'm suggesting here that Batman Geldy's basic thesis has a spiritual component as well. That these complex and difficult and seemingly insurmountable obstacles that we sometimes find ourselves up against actually have really simple solutions. Drink more water. And my main, my, my, uh, uh, what I'm going to maintain today is that for many of us, it is that we are lacking a basic connection with God in Scripture. We don't know how to read the Bible because we don't know how to read the Bible. We are intimidated by it. We're put off by it. And so we, we leave it to the experts. We leave it to the Pastor Asterix and the others and those that write the books because, I mean, the Bible is too big. It's too complex. I'm going to do my best today to disabuse your mind of that idea and to try and make the Bible feel more accessible and more essential to your life. I'm going to start with a passage right out of Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. One of my favorites. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, where the author of Hebrews says, For the word of God is living and powerful. What are those two words there? The word of God is what? Living, which is a strange thing to say about a word. The word of God is living and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow. That's the author's way of saying the whole person, the whole body. The word is powerful. It, it can, like a surgeon's scalpel, cut right into the, to the life of the believer and not just into the physical life, but notice, is a discerner of the thoughts and in the intents of the heart. That the Word of God has some living element. That, that the Bible, in some sense, is alive. It's powerfully alive, and it can discern, it can assess the thoughts and the intents, the motivations, and the attitudes of the heart. Notice the same verse in the New Living Translation. For the Word of God is alive and powerful. It is sharper than the sharpest two-edged sword, cutting between soul and spirit, between joint and marrow. It exposes our innermost thoughts and desires. Well, I think it's a safe thing to say that most of us would not want our innermost thoughts and desires put on display to ourselves or to anybody else. So already, just out of the gate, the Bible is a little off-putting. The Bible's a little scary. The Bible is something that you just can't come to casually. It's not sitting down. I was, I was uh, watching a, a YouTube video yesterday, and an advertisement came up for, I think it's NAB Bank, and a person was saying, oh, I love video games because when I turn on the video game, I just tune out, and I just don't think. I think a lot of people are looking for those opportunities to tune out in their life. They watch a television program so they can tune out. They watch sports so they can tune out. They watch a movie so they can tune out. They play video games so they can tune out. And all I can think to myself is, is life so short that you want to tune out of part of it? Right? Is life, is, 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 are years and life and health such a, such a non-precious commodity that you just want to check out? I'm not so sure. I'm, I'm not so sure that that's a good idea. And, and Scripture is not the kind of thing you can just casually associate with because Scripture will put the finger of God right on the pulse of your life, on the pulse of your finances, on the pulse of your marriage, on the pulse of your relationships. It's a scary book. It's a scary book, not because the story is scary and not because it's not filled with great good news. Of course it is, but, but when you read a book that's alive and powerful because it's not just words on a page, what we're going to see here is that the Holy Spirit works through these words and the Holy Spirit in His inimitable, wonderful way puts His finger on your situation, the thoughts, the intents, and the attitudes of your heart. And that's scary. That's a little scary, and, and so I suppose at times if we're given the choice to tune out and watch a movie or to open up Scripture, it's easier to watch a movie, right? A movie is less threatening. A movie doesn't put the, it doesn't give God a point of access right into your innermost soul like a surgeon's scalpel. Reading the Bible is less about being a scholar and more about presenting yourself to God, and I want to talk about that. Some of you are intimidated by Scripture, but I'm going to tell you today it's unnecessary. You do not need to be intimidated by Scripture because you do not need to be a scholar to understand Scripture. There is power in the Word of God, living, energizing, saving power in the same way that there is hydrating and health-giving power in water. 
And in the absence of water, a number of pathologies develop in your body. You get ulcers and all kinds of, you know, creaky knees and creaky elbows, and a series of pathologies develop if you're underhydrated. A series of spiritual, emotional, relational, psychological, familial pathologies develop if you are not connected to the source of life, which is God. All of a sudden you think, man, I've, I'm angry, I'm gossiping, I'm looking at pornographic websites, I'm spending my money in ways that is probably irresponsible. You think that's my problem. That's not your problem. That, that, that's not your problem. Your problem is actually a lack of a vital connection with Jesus, a regular, committed connection with Jesus. There's power. In fact, several years ago, I read this book called Education by one of the founders of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, Ellen White. And in that, in that book, I read this paragraph that's actually almost unbelievable. It's just astonishing, this notion, this idea, but it stands the test of Scripture. It holds up to scriptural scrutiny. Notice this. The creative energy that called the world into existence is in the Word of God. Just let that sink into your mind. What? What? The very power that said, let there be light, and there was light, and let the dry land come forth, and let the waters be gathered together in a heap. That power, that cosmic power, that power is found in the Word of God? That power is found right here. It's a power that we were designed to be connected to, to be connected to God by the Spirit through Scripture. This Word imparts power. It brings life. To continue with the analogy, in the same way that water brings life. And disconnecting yourself from water, becoming severely dehydrated, is an exercise in, in, in futility and in fatality. Every command in Scripture is a promise. Accepted by the will into the soul, it brings with it the life of the infinite one. It brings life into the soul. It transforms the nature and recreates the soul in the image of God. Friends, you cannot afford to be disconnected from Scripture. You can't afford it spiritually. You can't afford it financially. You'll make a host of really bad, uh, uh, ill-advised financial decisions if you're not connect connected to Scripture. Your marriage cannot afford for you to not be connected to Scripture. I, I am sad to report to you that since my arrival here, and I don't think there's a cause-effect relationship, or at least I hope there's not, we have had a number of marriages that have struggled and some that have even fallen apart completely. Okay, Your marriage can't afford you to be casual in your association with God through Scripture. Your finances can't afford it. You can't afford it. Your health can't afford it. Notice I'm not even talking about your salvation. I'm not even talking about your eternal destiny. No, 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 I'm just saying you as a person, you as a being, as you were created, you were designed in the same way that a plug has three prongs on it, on it and is designed to be plugged in. You have certain design elements, axiological elements that are designed for certain things. One of those things that you were designed for is to be connected to your Father who loves you so much. So I've got to say this to you, and this is frankly to myself as much as to anybody, because I love to read books on theology and philosophy, and, and I, I love this. But I'm going to suggest to you here that it's okay to read those books, but don't just read books about the Bible, and don't just read books about people who read the Bible, but read the actual Bible. Power is found in the Word. That's where the real source and the real power is found again because these are not just words on a page these are living breathing powerful words and so i thought it might be a good idea to to sort of teach you how to read the bible how do we come to this source and actually tap into it how to read the bible one more statement before we get into these uh seven points here i love this one a second statement here from the book steps to christ again by ellen white and i love this she says the bible was not written for the scholar alone. I love that. It was, not, it was written for the scholar. In fact, it was, but not for the scholar alone. Well, then who was it written for? On the contrary, it was designed for the what kind of people? people. For the common people. It was designed for builders and nurses and teachers and architects and doctors. And You don't have to be a theologian. You don't have to be a scholastic in order to... The Bible wasn't even designed for scholastics. There are certainly people that study it academically and they dive into the depths of the depths of the depths of the text, both systematically and exegetically, and there's a place for that. But don't think for a moment that, that, needs, that you need to have that level of qualification or of academic skill. Oh, no. You, you can come to the Bible, and by the grace of God... At the end of this presentation, you will say, you know what I need to start, if you're not already, I need to start making, connecting with God in Scripture a regular part of my life. So there's going to be seven steps here, really simple. The first one is make time. 
Make time. You've got to make time. People say, oh, I'm so busy. Let me tell you, busyness is the curse of the modern era, right? Uh, I think it was Luther that famously observed something like, you're too busy. You're not too busy to pray. You're too busy not to pray, right? You're too busy not to pray. Similar with Scripture. You will notice in your life that you make time for the things that are important. Everybody does. I, I get such a kick out of it when people say, well, you know, I don't have any time. I'm really busy. I have, I have no time. I have no time. I have no time. You have as much time as I have. Right? There's 24 hours in a day. There's so many minutes in a day. There's so many days in a year. There's so many, right? We make choices. Those choices then make us. And we are making choices, whether it has to do with our income that we have to have or our lifestyle or the kind of relationship that we want to have with our... We, we're making choices. And in the choices that we're making, we are prioritizing the things that are most important to us. Probably most of you brushed your teeth before you walked out of the room this morning, before you walked out of your house this morning. Most of you probably took a shower, right? All of you, fortunately, got dressed this morning. Right? You, you, have prior, you are here. You have, you have oriented your life in such a way that you have prioritized certain things. I'm going to hazard a guess that many of you have looked at Facebook this last week. Some of you have spent maybe hours on Facebook or on Instagram or some other social. You have watched movies. You have watched sport. Not all of you, but many of you. So you do have time. You do have time. You might be more or less busy than me, but you have time. And the thing about making time is that you don't find time, you make it, you create it. You create time for the things that matter most to you. Now, don't think, man, I'm going to have to start carving out one to two hours every day to study Scripture. Oh, no, no, no. The seven-step program to studying the Bible that I'm going to give you, to reading the Bible that I'm going to give you here, you can do in 15 minutes. 15 minutes. So just about the time that it takes you to take a shower, dry off, and brush your teeth, Okay. So, you don't find time, you make time. So, number one, you're going to have to make time. Now, my advising to you is to do that first thing in the morning. Now, if that doesn't work for you because you're a shift worker or some other, you know, element of your schedule, you know, your idiosync, I get it. But in general, it's best to do it first thing in the morning. Your mind is fresh. You, you're, you're, the day has not gotten away from you, et cetera, et cetera. Number two is to turn everything off, right? Now, you, you wouldn't have even had to say this 20 years ago, but now we have to say you have to turn everything off and research is actually now suggesting um, that smartphones may actually be making you dumb. Right? Smartphone, dumb person. And my, here's what I do. I don't know if you do this or not. Um, I turn my phone off at night. Does anybody else do that? You turn it off. It's amazing. It's, it's like we talked about a couple weeks ago. You have so many choices that all of a sudden those choices become debilitating because you, you're paralyzed by too many choices. The phone is the same kind of way. A phone is a really great thing. Don't get me wrong. I love it. I love the fact that I can take photos with my phone, and I can post photos on Instagram with my phone, and I connect with friends on my phone, and I can get FaceTime calls on my phone, and I can put out a tweet on my phone. I can even check my Facebook page. I like that. Here's the problem, though. That freedom that we have with this little personal device that we carry around with us, for many, has become not freedom, but it has transitioned into slavery. We are now in bondage to this thing that every time... We just, we, it's just, it's Pavlovian. We just are instantly to it. We hear the ding. We're, it's just, we have to have it. So if you're really going to spend 10 to 15 to 20 or whatever minutes, I'm not going to prescribe minutes here. My advice is turn your phone off at night and don't turn your phone on in the morning until you've done this first. Because nobody that you have to, listen to me, nobody that you have to talk to in the course of that day is more important than talking to your heavenly father. Right? I mean, there's going to be some important, you're going to get some important phone calls. You're going to have some, you know, maybe even urgent meetings at work. Maybe there's been an emergency. I get all of that. But nobody is more important than talking to Jesus. Right? Spending some time. So your smartphone be making you dumb and, dumb, and your essential electronic connection to them, whoever them is in your case, may be short-circuiting your living connection to him. Okay? Which is why my personal advice to you is don't use your phone as your Bible. Okay? You spend enough time looking at that phone. You can if you want. If that's your choice. I realize you're a young person, you're a modern, you want to do that. But I, my suggestion is get a paper Bible. Something that doesn't have a screen on it. Something that can't have a notification. That can't. No, no. Just leave that thing turned off. They do turn off, by the way. I know that'll come as a surprise to some of you. Um, number three, say a simple prayer of surrender. So you've made a little time and you've your, your phone is in the other room. Your computer's in the other room. It's just you, right? Just you. Say a simple prayer of surrender. The key word here, key phrase here, is of surrender. Not just a simple prayer, but a simple prayer of surrender. Let me walk you through what that looks like. John chapter 7, verse 17, Jesus said, If anyone is willing to do his will, the will of God, he will know of the teaching. Notice the order there. If you're willing, you will know. So let's just sort of unpack what that looks like. What Jesus is saying is, is that surrender precedes seeing. 
You want to see something. You want to understand something. You want to grasp something. You don't grasp it so that you can surrender. You don't perceive it so that you can surrender. No, you surrender first, and the understanding, the knowledge, the perception follows. If anyone wants to do, they will know. Here's another way to say that. Willingness precedes wisdom. A willing heart is far more important than a PhD when it comes to understanding Scripture. Let me say that again. A willing heart is more important than a PhD if you want to come to understand Scripture. Come on up here, Jarvis. He's loving. He's coming forward for the altar call already. <laughs> Proverbs chapter 9, verse 10. Many of you have heard this before. The fear of the Lord is the what? It's the, the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is itself understanding. Notice that, that, that there's a posture that precedes perception. You want to understand what Scripture's teaching. You think, man, i got to know Greek. i got to know Hebrew. i got to get three translations. I've got to get a strong concordance. I've got to get a lexicon. No, 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 no. You need to get a willing heart. Now, trust me. Jesus can take care of the Greek thing and the Hebrew thing. He speaks every language. He speaks English, too. He even speaks Australian, I think. He speaks all of the languages. So, so, so you don't have to have, if you do have your degree in, in Greek and you know, ancient Greek and Hebrew, good, good for you. Nothing wrong with that. In fact, there's a lot right with that. But you don't have to have that. The only thing you have to have if you're going to understand God's word to you in Scripture is a willing heart. A willing heart. Okay? So you come with a willing heart. Notice we read this earlier. The creative energy that called the world into existence is found in the word of God. But notice the second paragraph here. Every command is a promise accepted by the will received into the soul. It brings with it the life of the infinite one. The will. Right? The will is not just the mind. It's not just your thoughts. It's not, it's not just some theoretical or hypothetical. No. If you say, God, show me and change me. In fact, for some of you who want it super practically, like Pastor Asher, just make it as practical as can be. Okay. I don't know how to make it more practical. I guess I could bend your knees for you and fold your hands and close your eyes for you. But this is, just pray this prayer. Open the Bible and pray this simple prayer. Father, show me who you are and who I am. Make me willing to change and change me. That's it. So you just sit down with the Bible in the morning. You've made time. You've left your phone off, and you just find a little chair or a little room or wherever, or even in your bed. I often just, my Bible's on my nightstand, and before I even get out of bed, I just reach over, grab my Bible, and I just pray a prayer like that. Father, show me who you are. Show me who I am. Make me willing to change and change me. And that posture of willingness, that posture of surrender, that posture of coming to God, not as an academic, you're not coming as a scholar to give an exegetical treatise on, you know, Paul's use of law in Galatians. That's not what you're doing. You're coming to your Father. You're coming to your God. You're coming to the source of life itself to connect with Him. So say a simple prayer of surrender. Now, number four is a big one here. If you're not a theologian, if you're not an academic, I think you can remember this one hermeneutical point. Hermeneutical just means the way that we interpret ancient text or modern text too, but hermeneutics means how we interpret something, how we understand something. And I don't expect you to, to, you know, to understand five points of hermeneutical soundness, but I'll give you just one, just one point of what the Bible is about. Remember that Jesus is the point. Can somebody say amen? When you pick up the Bible, just know that wherever you find yourself, and I get to that here in just a moment, wherever you find yourself in the Bible, Jesus is the point. And I'll walk you through that in just a second. It'll be helpful for you to know that the Bible is not a rule book. The Bible is not a code book or a textbook. It's a story book, and Jesus Christ is the hero of the story. Now, let's walk through each of those. The Bible is not a rule book. It certainly contains rules. It certainly contains moral exhortation. Nobody denies that. But those rules and those moral exhortations are part of a larger narrative, a larger story. Some people think the Bible's like a code and you have to find out what does it mean here and then you compare that when they're jumping all around like you're trying to crack some kind of a Da Vinci code or something. The Bible is not written like that, right? The Bible is, there are senses in which there's a prophetic code and we can understand what a woman means in Bible prophecy and what water means and what a beast means. There are passages of scripture that are written in code-like or, or symbolic language. That is certainly true. But the Bible itself is a book filled with stories. David and Goliath and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and the fiery furnace and the feeding of the 5,000 and the walking on the water and Peter's denial of Jesus and Daniel in the lion's den and the building of the ark by Noah. And I mean, just go down the story. The Bible is made up of hundreds, perhaps even thousands of stories. It's a storybook. And Jesus Christ is the hero of the story. Jesus himself suggested exactly this in John chapter 5, verse 39. When speaking to the religious leaders of his day, he said... 
You search the scriptures because in them you think you have eternal life, but the scriptures point to me. So number one, you've made time. Number two, you've turned things off. Number three, you've said a little prayer of surrender. You're not a theologian. Don't pretend like you are. Now all you're going to remember is this simple hermeneutical point. Jesus is the point of the Bible. He's the point. He is the point that everything's about. In fact, I'll just give you a brief, brief, brief little sort of theological overview, a systematic overview of what Scripture is about. The Bible is divided into two parts, two halves or two testaments. They're not equal halves, but, but two primary parts, sometimes referred to as the Old and the New Testament or the Old and the New Covenant, right? And very simply put, the Old Testament is anticipation of Christ. The Greek word Christ is the same as the, the Hebrew word Mashiach or Messiah, there's a longing for the Jewish nation looking for a Messiah, longing for a Messiah, hoping for a Messiah. And so the entire Old Testament is anticipation of Messiah. And the New Testament is the realization of Messiah. I like it this way. The Old Testament is a promise made. The New Testament is a promise kept. The making of a promise, the keeping of a promise. So when you open up the Bible, wherever it is that you open up to to read, you need to know, am I in the making the promise part or am I in the keeping the promise part? Right now, for most people, they find the keeping of the promise part, that is to say the New Testament, easier to read. Right? They find that easier. They find that more digestible and more palatable. And certainly, if somebody's new to Scripture, I direct them to the New Testament generally. Right? But as you advance in your understanding of Scripture and as you advance in your walk with God, you can go back to the promise made part. Right? God made a promise and He kept the promise. They were looking forward to Messiah and then Messiah came. Now, let me walk you through that in even more detail. A sort of eight-part division of Scripture, so you can get a feel for how all of Scripture ultimately is about Jesus. That's something for me to say. I can say that, and Jesus can say that. All oh, the Scriptures are about me, but some of you are like, yeah, but I don't understand that. Explain that to me, David. Make that super practical. What do you mean Scripture is all about Jesus? Well, here you go. The first five books of the Bible are what's called the Law, or Torah, the writings of Moses. And the Law is the foundation for Christ. It's laying the foundation for Messiah to come. In fact, Moses, in one of his last sermons that he gave to the children of Israel, said, God will raise up another prophet like me. And there's basically universal the uh, 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 academic consensus that he is referring to a coming prophet, not just any ordinary prophet, but to the prophet that would come, that Messiah will come. And so the law lays the foundation for Christ, number one. Number two, you have all these Old Testament historical books. You have the Kings and the Chronicles and Judges and Samuel. These, these are preparation for Christ, basically showing us that, that human beings got it all wrong. And we've done that in this church when we went through our Blazing Grace series, took a look at the kings of Judah and the kings of Israel and showing how they consistently got it wrong. They got it wrong. And so all of this is basically getting us to the place where we have this sort of sense of expectation and this pregnant sense that, is this ever going to have a happy ending? I mean, is anybody going to come and make this right? You're supposed to feel that way. So if you're, if you're opening up the Bible to read and you find yourself in one of the Samuels or one of the Kings or one of the Chronicles and you're feeling this kind of uneasy tension like, hey, a lot of these stories are really bad news, that's because you're in the preparation for Christ. You're reading the, hey, this didn't all work out. In the inimitable words, in the inimitable words of the book of Judges, it says that every man did what was right in his own eyes. There was no king in Israel in those days and everybody just did what they wanted. They're, they're looking forward to, they're anticipating Christ to come. Number three, Old Testament poetry. We read the Psalms and the Ecclesiastes and, and Song of Solomon. This is aspiration for Christ. As, as Brittany read this morning in our worship service, I think it was Psalm 100. Was that right, Britt? Was it Psalm 100? I think she, she read through. It's just, it just this longing for something better, for something more. David crying out and the other psalmists and crying out of, in aspiration for Christ. We get to Old Testament prophecy, especially prophecies in Jeremiah, Ezekiel, particularly Isaiah and Daniel. These are, these are anticipations of Messiah. Jesus is coming. Isaiah 53, of course, who has believed our report and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? That beautiful prophecy of a suffering Messiah. All of this is expectation of Christ. So that's the first four parts. Now we transition to the New Testament. And, and this is where we get to the promise kept part. This is much easier for many people to read. Now we're into the Gospels, which is now the manifestation of Christ. Here he is. Here's Messiah. And so if you open up the Bible, say, I'm going to read John. Well, now you know where you're at. You're in that promised kept part. So a lot of the enigmatic things that Jesus says and does are in reference to the fact that a promise had been made. So when John the Baptist, for example, says, Behold the Lamb of God, if you're like, what does that mean? Well, that's a reference to the promise that had been made. 
A promise of a sin bearer. The promise of someone that would take away sin and guilt and shame and even death itself. And so you're finding this language and this, the, 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 these words and these phrases and these parables in the, Old, in the New Testament. This is a part of the outflowing of the fulfillment, fulfillment of the promise. Then we get to the book of Acts, which is the preaching of Christ. Hey, if that's where you open, the, up, open up the Bible, you know where you're at now. You're in that phase of Scripture where Messiah has come and he has died and he has been uh, crucified and he's, he's raised and he's ascended to heaven. And now the early church is preaching that the promise has been kept. And now you know that. Or maybe you decide you want to read some of the epistles of Paul or of Peter. The letters, which is much of the New Testament is made up of letters. Well, this is the interpretation and the application of Christ. Oh, Jesus has come. What did it mean that he came? How do we apply the teachings of his life? How, how do I interpret the coming of Jesus? How do I apply the coming of Jesus? And then finally, if you're like Andrew Weeks, who told me just this morning, wherever you are, Andrew, uh, he told me just this morning, he's reading the book of Revelation. Wow, man, the, and he said, it's a nightmare. I think that's literally what he said to me. He said, I'm reading, is that what he, that's what he said, Andrew. He said, I'm reading the book of Revelation right now. It's a nightmare. And well and truly, it's the stuff of which nightmares are made. There's no question. Beasts and dragons and crazy stuff. Right? There's no question. But here's the point. It's actually, it's actually the conclusion of the nightmare of the world without Jesus. Because in Revelation, what we see is consummation in Christ. The hero of the book of Revelation is the Lamb. The very Lamb that we encountered back in the Gospels and the Lamb that we encountered all the way back in the law, the writings of Moses, which was the foundation. So where do you find yourself? Are you in the foundation for Christ? Are you in the preparation for Christ? Are you in the aspiration for Christ? Are you in the expectation of Christ? Are you in the manifestation of Christ? Are you in the preaching of Christ? Are you in the interpretation and application of Christ? Or are you in the, in the consummation in Christ? Knowing that just in and of itself will help you to know, oh, so Jesus is the point, and this is how he is the point in this passage of Scripture that I'm in, or this book. No wonder the Apostle Paul could say in one of my favorite passages in the New Testament, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20, and I love the New Living Translation here, for all of God's promises have been fulfilled in Christ with a resounding yes. All of God's promises are a yes. God didn't say no. He said yes. He said yes. He said, yes, in Christ. I love that. And so remember that Jesus is the point. Number five, now put yourself into the text. Right? You know, this is like a full two minutes of, by, of past now. You've made a quiet space. You've turned off your phone. You've said your little prayer. You've opened up the Bible. You've oriented yourself. Where am I at in the story of Jesus here? And so you're only two minutes in. We're not talking an hour that you've got to carve out of your day because you're so busy. I am too. I get that you're busy. I get that life has its pulls and its tugs and you might have a long commute or this is a period of significant uh, busyness or, you know, a birth of a child. I get that. I got, I got two sons and, and we're a single income family. I know about, about all of the stresses that you know about, okay? I get that. So, so sometimes you're going to have a little more time. Sometimes you're going to have a little less time. But at this point, you're only two minutes in. You're just two minutes in. And now you're just going to put yourself into the text, whatever this text is that you read. I love 2 Corinthians chapter 10. In 2 Corinthians chapter 10, in the first 10 verses there, the Apostle Paul tells the story of Israel. He says that Israel came out of Egypt and they passed through the Red Sea and manna came down. It's fascinating. He's sort of telling the story of the Exodus. And then he says this. A lot of people miss this. He tells the story of the Exodus and then he says, these things happened to them, the Israelites, as an example, but all that stuff was written down for our instruction on whom the end of the ages have come. Fascinating. You know what Paul is saying here? Paul is saying, when you read the story of the Israelites, put yourself in the story. Put yourself uh, making your way out during Passover or in it, receiving the manna as it falls from heaven. Put yourself into the story. Read yourself into the story. Is it the time of David where David's fleeing from Saul? Put yourself into the story. What are the lessons? What are the points? What are the applications there? And they're not... They, they don't have to be these profound, in-depth theological insights. They can be really simple things like God comes through in a pinch. That could be your takeaway. In fact, notice what I've got here. Look for that one personal takeaway. I realize that in a day and age of smartphones and, you know, things that choo -choo 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 -choo, just uh, so fast, so quick, we just need whatever we need, we need it right now. And, and our attention spans are suffering. By the way, there's a lot of research on this. Our attention spans are suffering. And so probably you're not going to say, here's the five things I got from my reading of Scripture this morning. Just look for one. Just one. And this could take you five minutes. A full five minutes. And you're like, oh, that's a great point. Now here's the test. Here's the litmus test. That night when you tuck yourself into bed and you just get ready to turn off the light and go to sleep, ask yourself if you remember what it is that you read this morning. Okay? 
do your best to get one point, one salient point that you can just, that's the thing. That was the idea. The idea was to treat others like I want to be treated. The idea was that God comes through in a pinch. The idea was that God deserves my best. Whatever it is, whatever that thing is, just look for one point. And for some of you, if you get that one point, and this happens to me, I do this in my own personal devotions. I sit down, I might have 45 minutes, but I'm reading and I'm praying and I come across something and I say, you know what? I don't want to crowd that point out. That thing that Jesus just told me, which he told me in, in a minute and 45 seconds. It's not that I don't have time and it's not that I'm not devoted, but that is God's word to me today. Now, there are other times where I'm in Scripture for 20, 30, 40 minutes or an hour or more, but there are times where I can get whatever I need to get. And Jesus knows you're busy, by the way. He knows your schedule. He knows that you've got a busy time. In the, he knows that. So if you come to Jesus and you're just really open and honest with him and say, you know, Jesus, I'm really busy this morning, but I need a word. I need a word. Show me something about yourself. Show me something about myself. Make me willing to change and change me. Vroom. You find out where you're at. You orient yourself. You begin to read. And you know what? Jesus will give you a word. Jesus will give you a word. And then close it. And then, number seven, ask God to make it a part of your life. Whatever that thing is, that it not just be theoretical or intellectual or academic, but whatever that thing is. And friends, what you're doing is you're not just reading the writings of some sage or some rabbi. That's not what you're doing. You're connecting with the living God. The power that brought the worlds into existence is in the Word. And many of us suffer from a series of emotional, relational, spiritual pathologies. And we think, man, I got problems. You might have problems. But you might have a really simple solution that's right in front of you between two pieces of leather on your kitchen counter or on your nightstand or on the bookshelf. It literally could be that simple because exposure to God in the same way that drinking water just starts to take care of pathologies. I love the way that Paul says it in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 15 to 17. He's speaking to Timothy and he says, Timothy, you were taught the Holy Scriptures from when the time you were a boy. They have given you wisdom. Notice that, wisdom to receive the salvation that comes by trusting in Christ Jesus. Let me translate that for you. You read the Old Testament. There is, no Old Te there is no New Testament when Paul's writing this to Timothy. So he says, you read the Old Testament and you saw that Jesus was the point and you received Jesus. He says, that's what, he's, that's what he's saying. Then he says in verse 16, now Timothy, all scripture is inspired by God. Literally, God breathed. It's useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what's wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we're wrong and it teaches us to do what is right. Well, how does a book do that? Because it's not a book only. Yes, it is a book. In fact, it's a series of books, some 66 books. But it's, it's, it's God's Word, and God, by His Spirit, works through that Word and energizes in a way that, frankly, is supernatural. And if you've had that experience, you know exactly what I'm talking about. You think you're sitting down with, with paper and leather... And all of a sudden, in, in just a moment, in a stroke, in a sentence, in a verse, in a passage, in a word, in a verb, you are face to face with the living God. Amen. Can somebody testify? You're like, whoa, Jesus just showed up in my life. Jesus showed up in my morning devotions. Here I am. I'm not looking at words on a page only. I'm not looking at ink on a page. I'm face to face with the living God. And let me tell you something. When you get regularly face to face with the living God, you can face anything that life will throw at you. I had a really moving conversation, Graham. I didn't tell you I was going to say this, but it was, I think it was last Sabbath or the Sabbath before I was chatting to Graham just outside here. And he, he said something, I, I won't go into detail because I didn't ask for his permission to do so, but he said something to me, and if you know uh, Graham and the Rocher family, you know the adversity that they're in. He said something to me that was so salient, so moving. I shared it with probably two dozen people throughout the week. I said, I heard something today that just... Graham, it just touched my heart. It just, it just moved me and my soul. And I thought, that's a man who's been with Jesus. You get adversity. You get difficulty. You get what all of us would think would be the worst possible situation, a loved one suffering from a serious illness. And somehow in that, Jesus can carry you through that? Jesus can carry you through that. Jesus can carry you through anything. You lost your car keys. He can deal with that. Okay, you, you had your identity taken. Jesus can take it. Jesus, if Jesus can go into the grave and come out of the grave, he, he's got this. He's got this. So these amazing things happen when you, when you come and meet with God in Scripture. All of a sudden, you're face to face with the living God. You're face to face with Jesus. God has met you in the text. And I tell you, friends, that happens a few times. And 007 can't hold anything to it. 
God uses Scripture to prepare and equip His people to do every good work. Friends, you need Scripture like you need water. You might be walking around severely dehydrated. You think, man, i got all these problems. No, you don't have a bunch of problems. you just got one problem. You just got one problem, and that one problem is connection. It's connection with the living God. It's connection with Jesus. Friends, if you want to make the leap from crisis to casual into committed and by the grace of God even contributed to the kingdom and contributed to the local church, that is not going to happen while you're spending hours playing video games. It's just not going to happen. It's not going to happen while you, while you have plenty of time to watch movies and, and sitcoms and you don't have time for Scripture. There is a time and a place for some of these things. But, but you, you have to orient your life. The sun is shining, the birds are calling, the waves are breaking. What are you doing? What are you doing? Go take a walk, go hold your wife's hand, get a dog, uh, take up a hobby. I mean, come to me. I, I wish I had four lives to live. And if you're going to waste your life playing video games, come to me. I'll tell you something that I really wish I had time to get into. You can get into it for me. Take the photos and then tell me. Your life will be better. Your life will be better. Friends, I just urge you, Jesus, 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 Jesus is the point. Connection to Him will make your life better. It will make your family better. It will make your health better. It will make your finances better. You were designed to be connected. Amen. 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 That's how you read the Bible. It's not rocket science, right? It is a kind of science, but it's not rocket science. You just open up the Bible and meet your maker. And I'll tell you, if we have a spirit-filled, on-fire committed, contributing church, there will, people will come and they will stay and they will be converted and the Holy Spirit will be outpoured and amazing things will happen and nothing will be able to hold a candle to it. Yes, it's possible. Amen? Amen. That's church 101. Let's pray. Father in heaven, how to read the Bible, how to be connected. And Father, at the end of the day, I suppose this is just a sermon that could have been titled, How to Prioritize Your Life. And Father, forgive us where distractions and things come up and we find ourselves thinking, man, how did I get here? How did I end up here? We don't know how we ended up there, but we did. And there we are. Father, help us, especially those of us that really need to hear this message, help us to find ourselves getting up in the morning, opening up our Bible, and meeting you being infilled by the Spirit and coming face to face, coming into partnership with our Lord and Savior. Father, surely there is no greater joy. There is no greater happiness than fulfilling the purpose for which we were made and created. Father, I pray that this church, every member of this church, would move from crisis to casual. Lord, I know we got tons of contributed, contributor and, and committed people in this church. I love that. But Lord, we, we, got, we got some people that need to move. They need to move up. They need to move up from crisis to casual and from casual right into committed and from committed right into contributor. Father, help us to wake up in the morning and say, how can I connect with my God and how can I advance his kingdom is my prayer in Jesus' name. Let everyone say, amen. amen.